Welcome to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts for Tuesday, August 10th. Um, we are here today with committee members uh, Heath MacDonald, Gordon McNeely, Sid McEwen, Corey Deagle, Lynn Lund and myself as chair. Welcome back to Clerk Ryan Redden, nice to see you back. And welcome to our guests uh, who are here today um, to review the COVID-19 financial support program, the first report, which is the reason for the August meeting. Um, so before we get into the agenda, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved, Lynn Lund, thank you. Um, so I think if, if it's okay with our, with our guests, we'll just go straight into um, the, your initial uh, presentation on the report and then we'll go through that in its entirety and then open up for questions from committee. Great. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Well, thanks for having us in um, with me today. I know you're familiar with them, but uh, Jennifer Bonus is a director of quality assurance in the office and she was the lead, the team leader on, on, this, uh, on this file. Mm -hmm. And Sherry Griffin, who's the director of uh, performance audit in our office. So we'll get started. This presentation has a bit more discussion mm -hmm. in my notes for each slide, so it, it may take a little bit longer to get through than, than other ones, but there's a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to try and give as much detail as I can without uh, boring you to death too much. So we'll start. So the background. Um, on March 16th, 2020, a state of public health emergency was declared in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. On the same date, the Treasury Board agreed to recommend to Executive Council that a COVID-19 emergency contingency fund in the amount of $25 million be established. The purpose of the fund was to enable government to respond swiftly to individuals and businesses facing financial hardship due to the pandemic. Two subsequent recommendations were made by Treasury Board to increase the fund to $40 million on April 8th and then an additional uh, increase to $75 million on April 22nd. On April 10th, our office was asked to complete a financial examination of the provincial government's COVID-19 programming and supports. So we, within our report, we, we broke our our examination into three phases. So, so the, our first report dealt with phase one. And within phase one, uh, we identified 21 programs. And these 21 programs included financial support program payments paid from the emergency contingency fund with application deadlines up to and including August 31st, 2020. The 21 programs were administered by six departments and one Crown Corporation. So the departments were the Department of Finance, Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, Department of Agriculture and Land, Department of Transportation and Energy, Department of Social Development and Housing, and Department of Education and Lifelong Learning, and the One Crown Corporation was Innovation PEI. These programs had total budgeted expenditures of approximately $52 million dollars and the total actual expenditures for these programs as of the date of our audit report were approximately $38.6 million. And Appendix D within our report kind of details um, the budgets and actual for each of, each of the different programs. So our, the objective uh, and scope of our audit we, basically broke it down into two specific items. One was to determine whether the province had obtained appropriate authorizations for financial support programs initiated in response to COVID and whether they maintained appropriate oversight and controls over disbursements made under these programs. So the scope period for the audit was uh, it started March 16th, 2020 and it went up to March 31st, 2021. And a few things that we did kind of exclude from the work that we did were deferral programs. So for example, a property tax deferral program, we didn't uh, get into that. Programs that were paid through existing department budgets, we didn't get into those because we couldn't, we only looked at what was specific through this fund, the emergency fund. And employment program extensions, 
So for example, a, an employment program that might get 400 applications in a normal year, and if it got 700 applications because of additional funding, we didn't get into that because we couldn't identify what was specific to COVID. So our conclusion, uh, for phase one, overall, we concluded that the province did obtain appropriate authorizations for financial support programs initiated in response to COVID-19, but we did identify weaknesses in oversight and controls over the disbursements made under these programs. The emergency contingency fund uh, their final approved amount was $75 million, and this was approved through uh, two items. One was a special warrant in the amount of $50 million, which was approved by Executive Council on May 14, 2020. And the remaining $25 million was done through General Government's 2020-2021 Appropriation Act. So dealing with program approvals, we found 12 of the 21 programs were not approved by either Treasury Board or Executive Council prior to the programs being announced to the public. However, in all cases, the programs did eventually receive the appropriate Treasury Board approval. Program delivery, uh, Treasury Board approval was not obtained when budgets were exceeded for three of the programs. So those three programs were employee gift card program, where the original budget was 300,000 and the actual spent was $787,500. The community champion gift card program, where the original budget was $225,000 and the actual amount spent was $252,000. And temporary rental assistance benefit, the original budget was 1.5 million and the actual amount spent was 1.64 million. So the total amount in excess of original budgets for these three programs was approximately $655,000. Program procedures for some programs did not outline <clears throat> proper authorization levels or requirements for segregation of duties between those who processed applications and those who reviewed and authorized the payments. So these six programs uh, that we identified were employee gift card program, Community Champions Program, Income Support Fund, Special Situations Fund, Temporary Rental Assistance Benefit, and Child Care Allowance. We noted that for one of the programs, the Temporary Rental Assistance Benefit, the same person processed the majority of applications in our sample. So applicants were not always required to attest to all eligibility criteria. Um, of this, uh, sorry, for seven of the 21 programs, applicants were required to attest to the eligibility criteria rather than submit documentation with their application. This process allowed departments and crown corporations to process applications more efficiently and simplify the process for applicants. Of the seven programs, we noted two programs where some of the eligibility criteria was not included in the attestation statement which is, is causes a problem because it is important that applicants are aware of all eligibility requirements before applying for supports. So the two programs that we identified were Skills PEI, the Income Support Fund, and the Employee Gift Card Program. Funding was sometimes provided even though the applicant did not meet all eligibility criteria or insufficient documentation was submitted. In three of the 21 programs, information provided by the applicants indicated that they did not meet all eligibility criteria. However, funding was still provided. Applicants disclosing they were in receipt of other government funding when the eligibility criteria specifically stated the applicant could not be receiving other government funding. In seven of the 10 programs where documentation was required to be submitted, we noted various instances where insufficient documentation was provided by the applicants, but funding was still provided. Two programs had errors in payment calculations, one of which had errors for 60% of the applications in our sample. 
the two programs were the emergency relief grant to centers and emergency income relief for self-employed. We noted issues with signing authority in three different programs. Uh, workers' assistance program had various instances where one person was approving payments even though they had not been delegated signing authority by the deputy minister in accordance with Treasury Board policy. Support for essential workers program had 11 contracts with employers for over $100,000 that were not approved by Treasury Board. Deputy minister approval was provided for those programs, however. School food, school food program, uh, documented deputy minister approval was not obtained to use the exemption for tendering under the Public Purchasing Act. There were no documented agreements with some third parties uh, which distributed funding on behalf of the province. So the economic support for student program, no contracts were signed with Holland College, UPI, or College de Lille. Other program using third party was PEI Potato Board, uh, and there was an agreement in place with, with them. For nine programs, there was no documentation available to indicate a quality review had occurred. These nine programs were emergency income relief, income support fund, employee gift cards, community champions gift cards, temporary rental assistance benefit, school food program, essential worker child care, special situations fund, and emergency relief grant to centers. By relying on attestation to process applications efficiently in a state of public health emergency, the risk of ineligible claims is increased. For financial support programs, especially those processed using primarily attestation by applicants, post-payment verification should occur. Post-payment verification would operate like an internal audit where a sample of payments made under the program would be examined for key supporting documentation to confirm Excuse eligibility. Me. There's a lack of post-payment verification plans for four of the seven programs which process applications based on that testation. So those four, four programs are employee gift card program, Community Champions Program, Special Situations Fund, and Emergency Relief to Child Care Centers. Treasury Board assigned administrative responsibilities for the financial support programs to departments and Crown Corporations, which would accept, process, and authorize applications, as well as make payments. Updates on total expenditures, as well as number of applications for each program, were provided to Treasury Board on a regular basis. At the time of the audit report, formal assessments have not been developed for 13 of the 21 programs. Nine of the programs do not have assessment plans in place. Or sorry, nine of the programs do have assessment plans in place. These formal assessment plans were developed by individual departments and Crown Corporations which, is, which administered the programs and generally take into account factors such as total expenditures, updates on performance against key indicators, as well as summary of feedback from stakeholders. The remaining 13 programs do not have assessment plans. Assessments provide the opportunity for reflection and learning on what worked and did not work when dealing with future emergency situations. And the last slide, in total, we made three recommendations to the province. Those are included in Appendix A of our report, as well as management's response to those recommendations. And our office uh, plans to follow up on these recommendations within 12 months of our report. So that's that. Okay. And then before I go to questions here, um, Darren, would you just be able to kind of confirm this is the first report, so the first one with the context you'd said was up to um, expenditures incurred uh, to August 31, 2020. And what are the other reports and the kind of timelines that we're expecting in on ongoing with this project? So th this covers applications with a deadline of August 31st, okay. although some of the expenditures Sorry. may have occurred after that. Right. The timeline for the next 
round of reports? That's a good question. I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, phase two covers the remaining programs with application deadlines that extend beyond August 31st. Um, and some of those, we're still trying to determine if they've extended beyond March 31, 2021. Right. Um, and phase three, um, we're in the process of planning for, the, for that, so I really, I don't, I don't have any answers to when okay. you'll see those. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, I'll open it to the committee for questions. Come on, jump at once. <laughs> Somebody has to. <laughs> Lynn? Thank you, Chair. So I think it's important to understand the context in which a lot of these decisions were being made. I know I was receiving calls from my constituents who were very concerned, and I absolutely understand government felt a need to move things forward fast, and that was, that was critical. But moving forward, it's important to look at ways we can make sure we do better as we face new emergencies. So... That, that caveat is on my questions for sure. Uh, one thing that you had identified is that um, basic approval processes would, would have one person approving an application and another person distributing funds, but that didn't always happen. And in a lot of cases, it was the same person who was approving that was distributing funds. I was just curious if when you were talking to the departments about that, if staff shortages due to the pandemic were part of the reason that so few people were, um, such a limited scope of people were involved in this that we didn't have the normal process on that. Jennifer, do you want to Yeah, I can speak to that. I, there was one program in particular, which Darren noted in the presentation, where there was one person that processed the majority of the applications, that being like approving the application and approving the payment. That was uh, probably the only one that had that issue. Um, I think the other issue was that there wasn't staff doing a review. So if a staff person approved an application, there wasn't an intermediary person to review that, yes, this person was actually eligible to receive funding under the program. So, and I think in that case, the departments were saying that it was it was a staffing. They had staff working from home, so they were trying to get this, these funds out quickly. So staffing was for sure an issue. Okay. And that makes sense. We can certainly understand that, especially in the beginning stages. Um, there was also a note in your report that um, there were many instances where funds were distributed despite a person not meeting all of the eligibility requirements. And I was curious if it was a case where after hearing instances from multiple people, we realized that the eligibility requirements may need to be changed, and then they were updated to reflect that perhaps this program wasn't meeting the needs that they were originally set out to. Once we found cases where people were getting funds despite not meeting the original eligibility criteria, I guess my question is, was the criteria updated to reflect the actual need in the community? To the best of my knowledge, I don't think that took place. No. There were some where eligibility criteria did change throughout, but not in that instance. Okay. Thank you. Gord? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this report and, and um, coming in. Um, the 60%, the when you'd mentioned 60% um, of there, there was errors in 60% of um, a cert. Could you t just talk a little bit more about that? What was the sample size and 60% and, um, um, of payments within the sam uh, sample had errors? Pick that up. Um, so what? that was, um, if you go to Appendix F of the report, um, that was, it'd be program number 20. So it was the emergency relief to child care centers. And our, the sample size for that um, population, we, we selected 31. So 60% of those had calculation errors in them. So that affected the amount of money that was going out to those people in a, were they getting overpayments or underpayments? It was a mixture of both. Some received too much, some received not enough. 
Go ahead. Do you know of any, are they rectifying that or looking at? Um, so the ones that received too much from, when we met with the with um, executive council to review our findings, um, the centers receive continued support from the province. So they, their plan is to recover any funds that they have overpaid through future funding that they provide to those centers. So their, their response was that they, they will try and recover those funds. Go ahead. Um, with the, we understand the times and, and the, the speed at which the, um, and I remember the, the, um, the third party uh, distribution program, um, but you said there was um, a lack of documented agreements. Um, did, is it, you know, it, it would just seem like it would just be a simple agreement that could have been made up um, in, in speed of time, but were, were, was there anything there? Was there um, any kind of accountability there uh, at the time? Did you see any along the way? No, and, and that's really what the, the purpose of the agreement is, is to give the province um, the right to come in and look to see, the, to make sure the money was spent the way it was supposed to be spent. And without any agreement, you know, the, the province just gives up that right. And, and looking back in time and as the program went along, did they, I think there was maybe one big output of, of uh, third party relationships and it went out, but then was there other ones and did those, did those contracts or agreements get, get put in place for future distributions? Jennifer can add to this, but I think, believe for the three that they didn't have agreements, I don't think agreements were ever put together. But with the PEI Potato Board, there was an agreement put in place for that, um, for that agreement, and um, everything that was paid out by the PEI Potato Board was done properly. Um, the, the traditional process of program and approval and modifications were not followed. Um, did you find that this was occurring evenly across the board or were there exceptions being made for some but not others? I wouldn't say it was across the board. Like some, some departments, what we found were the departments that typically deal with programs did a pretty good job, but departments that typically don't deal with program applications struggled a little bit. That's good. We know okay. Okay, I'll give committee members a chance to see if they have any other questions. I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask as well. Um, a couple of these programs, I know immediately off the top of my head, are, are the result of um, the federal issues that were delivered provincially. I know I'm looking, I'm, if I recall, it feels like a long time ago, but the, um, the support for essential workers earning 3,000 or less um, was, was the big one that I, I remember. Um, were there different requirements or financial requirements needed to be in place for those programs to be delivered, where there was, you know, a direct link of a federal fund being delivered provincially versus the, the provincial fund? Does that make sense? Sure, I quite understand. Yeah, so well, I was you're talking a lot about the, you know, the, the requirement for, um, you know, the requirement that we need for accountability and be able to follow up and so on. Are there different sets of requirements in place when those funds are being allocated from a direct federal to provincial transfer? So we didn't get into looking at the criteria from the federal funding that came in. We just specifically looked at the provincial programs. So that would be a different type of audit to get into. Okay. So, so those, I'm just going to elaborate a little mm -hmm. bit. So that money did come in federally, but the province was um, to administer the program. Okay. So the province stipulated, you know, what the eligibility criteria and the need was for that money and they ran the program through Skills PEI. So we audited that portion of it, not okay. between the feds and the, and the province. Thank you for that clarification, because I know that the, the criteria for that provincially were different than they were in other provinces, and yeah. so that was part of how that, that worked. Right. Okay. Um, and part of the reason for asking that is that we know that, you know, pr in other pre- or non-COVID um, funds and responses, there are some very strict criteria mm -hmm. for demonstrating um, eligibility 
um, that the, the CRAW process for application has been robust and that the follow-up and validation is robust. Um, and so where there is something like that, has, has that requirement been put in place for many of those federal transfers that we're aware of? Well, that one is, is the biggest one for sure. And in that program, documentation was required to be submitted up front. So that wasn't a program that they relied on attestation. So right. the eligibility criteria was um, supposed to be supported with documentation. And I'm trying to recall on that program, I, I don't believe we had a lot of errors on documentation mm -hmm. on, on that program. Yeah. So. Okay, good. Um, you know, as my colleague mentioned, you know, that it, at the time, Okay, it feels like such a long time ago, but we know what it was like getting those those calls and trying to sort of help people connect to the programs and how essential these programs were. And some of the smallest programs are the ones that had the biggest impact, things like the gift cards, um, you know, getting money into people's hands when they we were absolutely desperate. And so on one hand, I completely understand why attest attestations were the way to go, particularly when you are talking in some cases about a gift card for $100, um, there's a logic that says you don't want to make the program so onerous that, that people can't get to it, especially when we, we couldn't leave the house. For, you know. um, but I also recognize that that follow-up piece is important um, because we want to learn from this. You know, I, I really appreciate the, the point you made around the, the monitor evaluate report, where the overall point of that isn't to be difficult, it's because you want to improve. And I don't know if it's that we feel that we're going to see another pandemic next year, but something. You know, we've seen Dorian, we've seen the p pandemic, and, you know, we had the climate change report that comes out that talks about some of the things that we could be facing in the next few years. So this is about learning how to improve those programs. Um, what does follow-up look like when you've got a program that has been primarily delivered through attestation? What would that look like? Because it sounds scary. So what would that feel like if you were somebody who had received a gift card or an organization that had helped deliver gift cards to make that work? The attestation for the gift card programs is going to be, would be difficult. Mm. Um, but for the other ones, I think you'd, for the recipient, you mean? It's, yeah. I guess it's always scary if, if someone comes to you asking you for money back, especially if you applied in good faith based on yeah. your understanding of the program. Um, but having said that, um, for stewardship of government assets, government does have a responsibility to make sure that only those eligible did receive the funding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, like I said in the presentation, it's like an internal audit. You would take a sample of applicants, contact them and say, can you please provide um, the supporting documentation because part of the attestation requirements was they were asked to make, keep their records for th up to three years. Mm. So even though they didn't have to provide them, they still should have compiled them. To that, Darren, when it, when it comes to the gift card programs like Community Champions and the employee gift card programs, the employers um, applied on behalf of their staff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously each department has to decide how they're going to perform an internal audit, but in that case, I mean, I think their primary concern would be that the employer actually distributed the gift cards to the employees and the community champions that were identified actually distributed the gift cards to those that were in need. So I think mm -hmm. that's kind of what I expect that where that program would go, but again, that's, mm -hmm. that's up to the department. Thank you for that, and I, and, and I think that that's, that's something that's really reassuring to, um, I mean, there's a couple of pieces around it. One of the gift card programs may have been one of the least expensive programs, but perhaps one that had some of the biggest impact mm -hmm. for individuals. Um, I, you know, when you look at it as $100 a time, it doesn't feel like it would have made a big difference, but it really did. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that we heard that. So I think for people to feel like they were going to be asked to prove that they needed that card would be really difficult for them to understand. You know, for, so for us to speak about the context of why this is important, understanding that what we're asking is, was the program overall delivered appropriately, where the responsibility sits with the community champion or with the, with, with the, the, the applicant, which in this case was the company, mm -hmm. um, would make it feel a little bit more balanced. Yeah. yeah and, um, 
and then it would be a game, what could we do next time? Because there is, like you said, there is a big piece in there about ap applying in good faith. Mm -hmm. If we were genuinely meant what we said at the time, which was we wanted to help the community by giving what they needed right then, which was food, mm -hmm. then you don't want to then follow up and say, well, next time we're not going to do that because it was too hard. Right? So, so that, that's a really important message. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly, yeah, as a constituency, MLA, the, the, rather than public accounts person, the, the gift card program was, was a really impactful one. Um, and you can see by the, the amount of expenditure versus budget, it was yeah. really, um, the uptake in that was really strong. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's my other question I'll ask before I come back to committee was um, where we do see the overages. And, you know, you mentioned about how there wasn't Treasury Board approval for the overages. And obviously, I, again, being remembering what it was like in it, I imagine it was because it was just going like a train. Right? You just yeah. don't have time to get there. Um, but overages doesn't necessarily mean that the program wasn't being delivered well. Right. It just means that you went over the budget, which is unfortunately, like you said, perhaps a sign of good of success or, like, or, or underestimating the need. Uh, yeah. And you would have no way of knowing what the estimate of the need was until these programs roll out the door. And when we we struggle a bit in drafting a report, we, we try to keep it balanced as, as best we could mm -hmm. and come at it kind of from the top as opposed to the, the ground roots kind of thing. So yeah. we hope that the, the recommendations, they're broad recommendations, but they cover um, kind of majority of our findings mm -hmm. so we we hope that um, they take some action on them because they are they're they're really more governance which we've talked about before systemic yes yeah, yeah. okay we'll come back to that um, I'll go with uh, Sid and then Gordon and Lynn Sid thank you chair uh, thanks again uh, for the report um, I'm like the other MLAs it's tough to come at this uh, to mm. you, know, you have to look at it with a, a through a certain lens, for sure, that you know the response was needed fast, and and I think people are appreciative of the response that was there. But of course, we do have to look at the governance part of it as well. So, you know, I do applaud the people that were in that position of trying to get this out the door fast, for sure. Um, as far as like the the uh, the approvals and the documentation, uh, it, it, you know, ignoring how fast they had to respond to this, is there? Any trends from what you've seen in previous reports about the ongoing, uh, uh, you know, your annual reports about Treasury Board approvals, that kind of thing? Is there anything that you feel that you've seen in, in past history that if that was rectified, that the process, the processes in, in getting this out the door faster could have been done better? Well, I think our findings are um, pretty consistent with what we typically find when we look at programs or departments um, and that's why our, our first recommendation is for Treasury Board to reach out to all the departments and crowns just to make sure that everybody is aware um, it's it's like a with processes and policies it it's a it's a daily reminder it, like it's <clears throat> my previous uh, employment we, we worked on processes every day it was just constant 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 so it's it's something that gets lost in in the weeds because you're you're busy doing your work and sometimes you you might know what the process is um, but you just you bypass or you overlook it but it, it's that's why that first recommendation is so broad mm -hmm. and as follow-up to that we'll expect to see the Treasury Board did re does reach out to the departments in, in some form to, to remind them of what those processes are. Sid? Sure. Um, looking at the management response, it was interesting to see that, you know, they uh, they noted, like, the response to Hurricane uh, Dorian, how they learned from that going into this one, mm -hmm. and then how they learned from this one going forward. Um, when you spoke to Executive Council about this, you know, what was their general feeling? Would they talk about they're going to be developing an evaluation framework for that response are you comfortable with with the response that executive council had to you when you were speaking with them i was comfortable with it they, they received our recommendations um pretty well um again some of our findings are in the scope of our work we have to report our findings 
Um, so sometimes it's a struggle to, to report it because of the situation that was at hand, but it's our job to report it, so, so we did. So um, they were receptive of our, of our findings. Um, so I guess it, the proof will be when we go to do our follow-up to see to see what's mm -hmm. kind of happened at that next. And it was for the programs that didn't have any sort of um, attestation follow-up plan, and they still haven't provided us any indication that they will. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do with, with mm -hmm. those ones. Sid? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and it's still important to, 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 to identify these things for sure. I mean, I mean, one of the th you know, things is when you've got huge amounts of money going out the door fast, there's always the, the possibility for, you know, uh, uh, people to do the wrong thing too. And it's good to see that, you know, that doesn't appear to be the case. And, and it's just, it's very much on the process and, and making sure it's done right in the future too. So, I mean, I think that's a very important thing, you know, for, for all of us that are representing Islanders to know that that was done okay too. So I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I was just reviewing Appendix D, and there is a, a column on the number of applications that were declined. And I was just curious if there was any digging into declined applications to make sure that everyone who was turned down and did not receive support was actually not eligible to receive support, or if there were any errors made on that side as well. So our samples did, we did have declined applications in our, in our samples. Um, and some of our some of our findings were that there was no documentation to support why or why not the application was denied or approved. So, um, you know, there, there were, we found numerous things throughout, but we did, our samples did cover both approved and, and declined applications. Good. But in some cases, it was hard to determine whether or not they were declined fairly because there wasn't supporting documentation. Is that what I'm hearing Correct. you say? Yeah. Good. Thank you, Chair. For people who were declined, like for an example, the uh, temporary rental assistance benefit, I see there are 222 that were declined. Was there a process for people to appeal if they were not receiving, if they were turned down to receive support for rental assistance? I, Jennifer, you might be able to add to that, but I don't believe so. An appeal process. I'm just trying to see how many of those we looked at. So for that program, Lynn, we, our sample size was 33, and 23 were approved applications and 10 were denied. So for nine of the 10 samples that were denied, there was no evidence of who reviewed it or approved the denied application. So in those cases, it wasn't an issue of that they were denied potentially inappropriately. It was, there was no review process on the actual denial. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. That's interesting. Did the department offer any comment on that, on why there was so little documentation surrounding these ones? I, I personally spoke to a lot of people who were struggling with rent during especially during those early stages of the pandemic. And I personally would feel more comfortable knowing there was additional information around those decisions that was available for review. Jennifer may be able to respond to that. She, she reviewed the findings with the individual departments and Crown Corporation, so she might be able to share some of what their comments were. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to recall we had 21 programs that we reviewed, so it's it's very hard to recall what some of the explanations were. But, I mean, I think when it came to the denials in this program, it was just an oversight, I think, to not document. A lot of these programs were uh, ran on um, new databases that were set up, and I think there was some maybe IT confusion with staff using these programs for the first time and not knowing necessarily how to properly document on the database, so I, I mean we could get back and see what the notes say, but that's my yeah. recollection. A lot of it too, with some of those, is there's, there was no process in place for a denied application to go to the next person mm. to look at it and see, you know, maybe this person should, maybe we should look at this again, or but there's just no evidence that that kind of review took place. 
Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I definitely find that worrying. Um, I would be far more concerned to think that someone who needed help didn't get it than I would be to think someone got a $100 gift card who may not have been in dire need of it. So I would be interested in asking some questions to the department just around that side of it, but I don't have further questions for you on it. Thank you. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Gord? Um, just talking about, um, it, was, it was noted that one program awarded contracts in the amount that would typically require um, public tendering process. Um, you know, it was it was tough at the time. I understand that, um, but do you know how many how many contracts were awarded that otherwise would have been publicly tendered? It, it was a school food program, and there were eight uh, different vendors in that program, and seven of those would have normally been tendered. Um, so they, I mean, there is there is a section in the. Of a purchasing act where, it, where in an emergency situation, deputy minister approval um, can be used instead. And the issue with that was that we didn't have evidence of a deputy minister signature approving these vendors being selected for the school food program. Gord? So who, who approved them then if the deputy minister didn't? Was it? Well, we looked to see that there was deputy minister approval, but there was no documentation of that approval. How do, we, uh, how do we ensure, uh, I'm just trying to figure out how do we ensure under rapid, diff difficult circumstances that, you know, there's a degree of competition and choice in the future with a program like of the tendering process? Again, it goes back to kind of discussion with Sid. It's the departments need to know what the processes are. And I, I know things were coming at them quickly, but minister does have discretion mm -hmm. to make that exemption. Otherwise, the process is to go to public tender. So the processes are there just to make sure that everybody's aware of how they how they need to get rolled out. I guess I'm just kind of looking at the back, looking back and then said if we had a fourth or fifth wave or something like how could we rapidly move in there and would those you know would we tender that next time and uh, you know just kind of like jumping and <laughs> jumping back and looking so I, I don't know what uh, the province's intentions are from our reports, um, but hopefully they'll put together some sort of a, a game plan for the next time with kind of checklists and balances to, to kind of, okay, we're ready to go. Here's, here's what each department needs to be aware of and kind of go from there. Um, Gord? Your third recommendation is calling government to conduct a formal assessment of the delivery of COVID supports, um, the COVID support programs. Do you know, um, has that work begun or have you had any indication about? We haven't done any of the follow up on that at this stage. Um, and the last question I have is um, you're, we're talking about, I mean, we're here, but phase two and three are going to be upcoming from your office. Do you have any indication about? How that work's going, and and um, when those will I just be. Asked that. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Phase, two, phase two, we're really in the early stages because with phase two particularly, we're some of those are related to tourism, and they were the end date kept moving, so we're trying to get our, a handle on kind of the application deadlines for for some of those uh, programs. And as an office, um, we're, we've had discussions on what's going to come out of that work that's different from what came out of this. And once we get a better handle on the money spent under those programs and what we think the risk, when we do our risk assessment of it, um, we, we may report back on kind of our progress or status because it's, to a certain degree, that phase one took up a lot of resources for our, our office and it's kind of, it hasn't kind of, it has impacted our other performance audits we've been able to do. <clears throat> so from an office perspective, and we'll have to have a discussion with executive council on this as well, is the cost benefit of continuing in terms of will our recommendations be much different 
than what we have here. Mm -hmm. Not that there will be findings, no, I'm not saying that we won't have findings, but are they going to impact our recommendations enough that we should devote a lot of time and resources to this, or should we go look at other things that may be more practical or relevant at the now? So that's the thing we're, we're, we're kind of struggling with. Mm -hmm. So as, as we get into phase two and three and see what we're dealing with, um, we'll have a better idea as to, as to what our next step is. Sure, appreciate your time and effort into this and looking at all these programs. Thank you. Heath? Uh, just uh, how much involvement do the special cabinet committees have in some of the programs? Well, this, my understanding, Heath, was, would be that they were very involved. Um, but one of the pieces of um, kind of audit evidence we were hoping to see were minutes of some of their meetings to get an understanding of kind of the rationale behind some of the programs. But there, we weren't provided with any minutes of those meetings. So just based on discussions with um, the members of, of, of executive council that we dealt with, um, I feel they were very engaged, uh, especially initially on when the pandemic first started in the establishment of the programs. Heath? Just curious, I, and this may have reference to your school food program, but uh, how many contracts were approved over 100,000? It's in here. So there were 11 agreements over 100,000. 11 contracts. Keith? And were basically those, um, those weren't approved through Treasury Board or they were approved through Treasury Board? They were approved by the Deputy Minister, but not through Treasury Board. Right. That's fine, thank you. Okay. Uh, a question regarding um, programs that do not have application process. So there's some programs which are where, you know, box lunches for truckers, where it's kind of clear how that was delivered. And I know the um, um, Islanders Helping Islanders through Agriculture was the food um, parcels that were being handed out, you know, at various bases. So, but even there, or, or the other one that I'm looking at, which is the emergency response to community groups and NGOs under social development and housing. It's half a million dollars, but there's no application process because the number of applicants is not applicable. So, so the, my question is, how was, it, how was that fund determined in terms of who got those funds? Because there are obviously there are a thousand NGOs in PEI who got the, the funds and how was that determined in terms of that, that amount of allocation? Of that program, uh, Treasury Board made the decision on what NGOs received that money, and then there was um, fifty thousand dollars of that money was left open for the department's discretion. Um, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what NGOs got that money, but they were they were decided at Treasury Board. Okay, and, and are there minutes for that? There are minutes for that discussion. Yeah. Okay. And that's the case, is that also the case for other programs where there wasn't an application process? So um, student uh, program research fund, um, the child care program, and so on, those ones were also done at the Treasury Board discussion in terms of how to decide where that money went? Yeah, I guess for the student support program, those were distributed to the post-secondary institutions, so that, that was decided. I guess just based on the, the nature of... And that's of the example where there's no, con there's no agreement. There's no agreement. Right. Yeah. So we can't do a follow-up on it. Right. And the, and the centres um, that... My recollection is that came about the centres that were able to remain open to um, serve the essential workers that needed care for their children. So... Okay. And with the PEI Potato Board, which, is, which was originally 
the approved budget was much larger than what actually ended up going out. Was that also just a, a direct and treasury board decision to allocate that fund? What was that for? That was for storage costs um, for potatoes. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So there's some of these questions then are going to be, I guess the question is how do we, how does this committee um, understand the decision process when the decisions are being made in Treasury Board and there's no follow-up because we either don't have a contract in place to allow us to do that or we don't have the information from Treasury Board available to us and we don't usually call Treasury Board into a... I don't know. Do we call Treasury Board into the committee? <laughs> this is the question. How do we? How how are we able to follow up? Um, and and should we? You know, because it's you know that that's this is one of the things that is more of a a process systemic issue is how do you choose the winners and the losers in 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 a community when you're talking about handing out money to NGOs and some got it and some didn't. How, do you, how does that choice get made and how do we know that that was actually an effective, fair and appropriate decision? And it comes, it comes down to the third recommendation really, like the departments and Treasury Board and Executive Council will need to sit back right. and kind of look at it from a big picture in, in terms of what worked, what didn't, um, did, it, did it accomplish our objective? Uh, and, and one thing our office is we're really going to work towards um, in the future with the provinces when programs get rolled out there really needs to be measurable objectives set at the time mm -hmm. so that when we come in or the, they themselves look at the programs they can see did we meet our objectives and if we didn't is the program should we just change the program or should we just drop the program altogether so we're going to work towards um, trying to see that happen a bit more mm. within government because it, it's very hard to, the questions you're asking, it's really hard to determine if it worked because you really don't know what right. they were trying to accomplish other than get money into people's hands yeah. as quickly as possible. And, and to be fair, that is also a reasonable objective. Yes. You know, in, in the context, of, especially when we're talking about some of these programs, that's an absolutely fair objective. But certainly with some of these other programs which are, which are more... I don't know, substantial in, in terms of sort of what perhaps they were trying to achieve. It's not really clear. Right. Yeah. I guess my last question before I come back to the committee um, is, you know, I have heard from some people saying, well, why do we need to do this? Because we're not, this is a one-time thing. You know, we're not, and I, and I absolutely appreciate that. We, I don't know if we'll ever see something exactly like this again with, we're hopefully, hope to God not, um, with COVID. But there are a lot of these programs that are actually, similar to or larger versions of things that we already do in, in government. Um, is there any reflection there that we should be having in terms of how the administration or decision-making processes here may reflect onto programs that we deliver on an ongoing basis? Um, so whether that's rental relief programs or um, community support programs or assistance funds, are there lessons that we can learn from, from that? And I think probably the answer is yes, in terms of process, um, but, but to improve and, and improve the outcomes and improve the delivery of programs on a general government basis. Well, I think some of the work that needs to take place is <clears throat> they need to reach out to the stakeholders mm. and find out if it did, did it help? Um, could it have been better? Is there other ways to deliver it? So those are the kind of follow-up processes that kind of need to take place. And each, each program would be different. Yeah. And that would happen with the department reaching out to the stakeholders in the community right. to get their feedback. Okay. Thank you for that. Committee? Do we have any further questions at this time? Do you have any other comments or thoughts that you'd like to, to add? No, just... Um, just to reiterate how, how much it, it did take of our yeah. resources. If we had our performance audit team is like a staff of nine and we had five members tied up for 13 months. So it's, it's a significant yeah. uh, piece of work for our office, which is, which is good. It, 
you can look at it as one audit or you can look at it as we did seven different audits because mm -hmm. we looked at seven or six departments in one crown. But it's, you know, I like to measure the work in our office by the number of reports we can produce. Mm -hmm. So this has kind of held us back in terms of how many we can, we can get out to look at individual departments more specifically. So that comes back to my earlier discussion as, as opposed to looking at um, the cost benefit of mm -hmm. completing phase two or three. And, so, and some of those discussions will need to take place with executive council. And does this, how would this committee, um, how can this committee support you in that, in that discussion? Um, I don't know. If, if we determine that, in our opinion, that any future recommendations that we provide wouldn't be any more useful than what we've already outlined here, um, and if we met with executive council and they didn't agree with us, then perhaps we could reach out to you. But um, it'll really come down to that meeting with executive council. And I, I haven't had this discussion with them yet at all, so you know, when they watch this, they'll probably be a little surprised. That, uh, <laughs> uh, That's always this. the best way to do it. <laughs> but I, I think in terms of why they wanted us to do this work was to make sure they did things properly, I think initially with the funding aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So they may be okay if we decide that what we found we'd probably find again and probably find again. Mm -hmm. So the caveat there is that the recommendations need to be acted on for that to be correct an appropriate course of action. Yeah, our follow we'll, we're still gonna do our follow up. But um, and again I'm not saying we're not going to, we just need to get into phase two and phase three a little bit more deeper to see to see if if we're going to find anything any different okay well as always thank you for your time and your candor it's always appreciated and for taking the uh, time to walk us through this today okay. um, and answering the questions okay? okay if I have no further questions the committee will take a brief break so that we can reset for the remainder of our agenda thanks
Okay, so we're back uh, following the presentation from the Auditor General and his team. Um, further to our agenda, I'm just going to make a, a with the committee's indulgence, just a brief um, uh, change before we go into our correspondence and scheduling is just um, if there's any comments or discussion of next steps from the committee in terms of either something that we want to think about putting into or start thinking about what we're going to put into our committee report. Um, we don't want to necessarily have to have further meetings, um, more meetings than we need to um, until we get to sort of reviewing our report, but I would really like to hear committee about what you're thinking about, in particular from the conversation today around um, around this special report from the Auditor General. Um, did we want to have a think about that and have that conversation at a future meeting, or is there any comments that you have now that you'd like to for us to consider? Or do we want to think about if there's any of the departments that we wanted to bring in from some of the findings or considerations that were in this in this report? And I'm looking at Lynn because we had, uh, I, I know both Lynn and I both looked at the social development and housing programs as one to ask questions on of the department, but uh, and we are scheduled to have them come in in the fall already, I think, yeah. But were there any other comments at this time that you wanted to make about about the report we should be thinking about? Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I suppose the only thing I would add is it might be nice for social development and housing to be prepared to answer some questions regarding this when they come in the fall. Mm. Just a heads up to them, as I'm sure they are watching now, <laughs> but <laughs> that that is something we're going to be following up on so yeah. that they can be prepared to speak to that. Yeah, we, we, that, the list is growing for them, but, um, but yeah. Were there any other departments that, that were highlighted in this that we felt we wanted to do any follow-up on? Is there any comments? Sorry, Gord? I was just thinking about the school food program, but I think that is under social development and housing too. So um, they would have been the department for the 11. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess the other the other piece around this is the recommendations themselves from the Auditor General, uh, that which are very much around process. Um, that obviously we could we could speak to in terms of reinforcing or supporting those recommendations um, when it comes to our own report. Perhaps what we'll do then, um, committee, if, if um, given what we've heard today, if you have any other thoughts or follow-up or feedback that you would like us to either discuss further um, or that require further witnesses to come into committee, if you can let um, myself and the chair, sorry, the clerk know and then we can begin to think about coordinating that for the fall. Other than that, I think we'd be okay to, to move on. Okay, thank you for that time. Um, so if we come back to the agenda, we have correspondence to review. Um, there are actually, there are two letters that were um, previously circulated that are provided to you, plus a third letter which is in response to one of the ones that we had circulated. So there's the July 5 letter from Cindy Harris, Secretary to the Treasury Board, in response to the committee's request regarding the correction of information in a recent summary of minutes and Treasury Board's role in relation to the implementation of the 2021 PEI International Student Program audit recommendations. And that letter um, kind of confirms that there was a clerical error that had been found and that it has been corrected and that uh, Treasury Board has no role in the implementation of audit recommendations. Um, the other letter is the July 7 letter to Daron Chesson, the Deputy Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, requesting an update on the implementation of recommendations for the 2015 audit of Access PEI. And there is then a letter in response, which was just circulated, I think, this morning. So we probably not, hadn't had a chance to have a look at that yet. If you want to take a moment, it provides update on those outstanding uh, recommendations.
the room is quiet where everybody reads. <laughs> I think this, uh, this indicates that these recommendations are met or are significantly in progress to be met by the end of this year, which is good, six years on. Does anybody have any comments or questions regarding the, um, the correspondence? You're all very quiet. OK. Thank you, Ryan, for organizing. So scheduling, as we mentioned, we have a couple of things set up or in progress for the fall. Where are we, where are we at? I would say in progress. Okay. Um, so the committee wanted to meet with education and lifelong learning on the PEI International Student Program audit. And the tentative date we're looking at for that is August 31st. Mm -hmm. But I need full confirmation from the department on that. Okay. Um, the committee wanted that to happen before September. The other one is social development and housing uh, uh, to review progress on a couple of past audits uh, as well as uh, discussion, which I assume we'll write to them about, uh, about uh, the COVID really funding programs. Um, the tentative date for that was September 21st. Again, though, I need final confirmation from the department on that. Okay. So if we can keep those dates free from committee, um, pending other potential summer activities. Um, and that those were the only things I think that we had on our, on our schedule. Was there anything else from committee that we had that was of urgency at this point? No? Those dates okay with everyone for now? Great. Okay. So we'll continue to make progress. Sure. sure. <laughs> Is there any new business from committee? In that case, I'll have a motion to adjourn. Heath, thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>